Winniewood, Oklahoma. I preached for Dal in uh, Dallas for a while back in the 1980s, and they would see that on a sheet of paper, and there, if you're familiar with the Dallas area, there was a part of it called Winwood Village. And somebody would see that and says, oh, you're from Winwood, Oklahoma. And I said, and you're not, <laughs> because that's not how it's pronounced up there. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about grief. This is really the first time I've shared the story of uh, what happened between Karen and myself when she passed away. And there will be a lot of personal things in it. You think, oh, you're a preacher. You know what the scriptures say. Yeah, but I also knew what my heart was saying as well. And so how do you balance those two together? How do you take what you know of God's word and be able to apply that to make it through some of the most challenging and difficult times that we will experience? Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 15, we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Death is a part of our existence. I think we become somewhat anesthetized to it because it surrounds us. Uh, we see other people losing loved ones. We read it in the newspaper. You see it portrayed on television. But when it happens to you personally, to somebody you're close to, uh, it takes on a whole different dynamic than it ever has before. And we realize death is part of our existence because of Satan. Death is rooted in sin. Satan tries to use it as a tool to destroy our faith. God has other intentions for it, but Satan tries to use it to separate us from God and separate us from knowing God does love us and he's there for us through times of grieving. And that there are very important lessons we can learn through those times. Romans 5 verse 12, through one man's sin into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So these are experiences that we're all going to have to face. Maybe it's a mother or father, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a close friend, some loved one. But when you're very close to someone and it happens, you have to deal with the emotions as well as your intellect trying to tell you to look at it from that point of view, your heart is tugging you in another direction. So I would like to share just a little bit about uh, the experience I went through as so you could understand where I was coming from and the process I have gone through and what I have learned about grief more so than I had ever wanted to know before. Uh, in November of 2020, Karen and I both contracted COVID. I, it, was a, it was a horrible event for me, but she had asthma, very bad asthma, and could not overcome the lung issue that it brought to her. And she was very stubborn. You know, I kept saying, let's go to the emergency room. I don't want to go to the doctor. She got weak enough to where she finally acquiesced and rallied. And then everything began falling apart. And I remember going up to see her in ICU on November 20th, 2020, when she passed away. And the nurse saying, we're glad you came when you did. We're getting ready to call you. And I said, what's going on? Because the numbers had been improving the day before. And they said, everything's falling apart. Her lungs cannot process oxygen any longer. We've got her on 100% oxygen. She's been on a ventilator. Uh, none of that was able to help her anymore. And we recommend putting her on comfort care, which basically was take everything off and let nature take its course. And so I said, how long will I have with her? And they said, two minutes. It was about two and a half. And so you're standing there thinking, what do I do? What can I say in two minutes that covers a lifetime? Uh, 
when she passed, it was nothing, anything I had experienced before could prepare me for. And once a loved one dies, the first question I was asking was, now what? You know, now what do I do? I can't tell you the number of funerals that I have performed as a preacher. And in a sense, I had become anesthetized to death too. You know, you, you just can't let every one of them rack you apart emotionally. And so you learn how to deal with it when you're not that close to an individual so you can encourage and be a strength for the family that's going through a very difficult time. But now the tables had turned. It's different when it touches your life personally. I had lost both my parents and very close friends that affected me deeply, but again, nothing prepared me for what happened when she passed. And in the process of going through grief yourself, then you have to face reality, but I have to be strong for others. I had to be strong for my two children, for my grandchildren and even my congregation. How's he going to respond? What's going to happen now? That question, now what, kept coming up. I'm not an expert on this subject. I can only speak of how I feel and what I've learned from it and what I'm still learning from it. But my prayer is that some of what I say to you will help when you have to face the death of a loved one. And just as importantly, when we as the body of Christ, we should be close, shouldn't we? We're family. How do we deal with someone who has lost someone? Sometimes we do great trying to encourage. Sometimes we do very badly dealing with people who have lost someone close to them. So. Even if you're not going to lose a loved one in the near future, how do you deal with someone you know that goes through that experience? How can you really try to help them? And you probably know this, but I'll say at the outset, there are no magic words. There is nothing you're going to say that will immediately take away the depth of the sorrow that a person is feeling at that point in time. And rather than perhaps saying some things that might wind up not being interpreted as they are meant, I have found as a preacher and as someone who had to go through this process that sometimes just being there and not really saying anything but just your presence and to know that you care and, and you're there to help any way you can, that provides so much more comfort than any words might be able to offer. I would also say don't deny those grieving the opportunity to relive the memories of their loved ones simply because it may be painful for you to hear. I was amazed. I had no idea this really happened. I was amazed within just a couple of weeks. It's like nobody wanted to speak about my wife anymore. And I wanted to talk about her and all the things she had done and what she meant to me. But nobody really wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. I had a lady come to my office one time and just she broke down in tears and says, nobody cares that my husband died. And he had been dead several years. And I said, well, yes, we do care. She goes, nobody wants me to talk about him. If I start to talk about him, they get up and I walk off. And I called her name and I said, tell me about Arnold. You don't want to hear about Arnold. I said, no, really, I do. Tell me about your husband. Tell me what made him so special to you. Tell me the things that you're remembering about him. And for 30 minutes, she cried and she talked and she left feeling relieved that someone still cared. Someone still remembered him. Someone knew how much 
he meant to her. So if somebody is grieving and they want to talk about that person that's gone, it's not going to hurt them. That helps. We may feel uncomfortable hearing them talk about somebody that has died, but again, it shows love and compassion that means more than perhaps we can ever know. So that's kind of the foundation I want to lay for what I have to say. Let's talk about three biblical principles that I think can help us on our own journey of grief once we encounter it, because unless the Lord tarries his return, we're going to have to deal with it or in trying to help someone else that goes through it. And I think the first thing I'd say is it's our right with God for us to grieve. It is not taboo. It is not a sin. Scripture offers examples of those who we know possess great strength spiritually, but they understood the emotional suffering and the grief that comes with part of the human experience because we do make bonds and we do have close ties and when those are severed, yes, that does touch us. Even our Lord understood that as part of the human experience that he went through when he was here to fulfill the will of the Father. If you have your Bibles with you, you want to follow along, that would be great. I'm going to start in Luke chapter 7. You thought I was going to go to John 11, and I'm going to get there in a minute. But in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11, Jesus and his disciples went to a city called Nain. And there was a large crowd coming and going. And as they approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow. Can you imagine the grief she felt at this point in time? She had lost her husband. She had lost her only son. In that society, I'm sure she was asking herself, now what? How can I provide for myself? Who's going to be here to, to help take care of me and, and be able to help provide the income for the things that, that are needful in life? And so beyond the emotional grief of losing these two close individuals, there was the reality of what's in store for me. And verse 13 tells us, when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. Now, he could say that because he knew what he was getting ready to do. And her sorrow was going to turn back to joy again. But he said he felt compassion for her. The term in Greek for compassion in this verse carries the idea of feeling deeply of feeling very emotionally. Jesus' heart was going out to this woman in the condition that she was in. And it touched him, and he used it as an avenue not just to be of help to her emotionally, physically, but to also testify to who he truly was, the Son of God. And the message that he had of hope and life that would come through him and what he could afford her and others who would be willing to listen to him and come in obedience to his will. But he felt compassion. He knew what she was experiencing, the, the grief that she had. He understood what that kind of grieving was like. Over in Matthew, the ninth chapter, and with verse 36, you remember Jesus going about teaching the multitudes who had been mistaught by the Sadducees and the Pharisees and didn't really know which way to go or what did God really expect of them or how could they ever please God with the burden of traditions that had been laid on him. It says Jesus felt compassion, same term for them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Weep with those who weep. Paul indicates to us, if we look over in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and with verse 13, of course, he's trying to correct 
some misunderstanding these new brothers and sisters in Christ had about, well, what about the loved ones who have died? Have they missed out on the resurrection? You know, do you have to be alive when Christ returns to, to have the hope of eternity that you've taught us about? So he was trying to correct their misunderstanding. But in introducing this topic, he says that we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. He didn't tell them it was wrong to grieve, but you don't grieve like those who have no hope, no hope of eternal life, no hope of a reunion, no hope of what it's going to be like when all the saved are gathered together in God's presence. Life is meaningless without that hope. When you die, it's over. And you will not know anything beyond that point if you take the atheistic point of view. And you may not be remembered for any length of time. I, I did a series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and I researched this out. And on average, you know how long people will be remembered in the here and now after you die? At best, three generations. Your kids, your grandkids, maybe your great-grandchildren. And beyond that, you'll be forgotten, unless you were George Washington or you know, the Ayatollah or somebody like that. For us normal folks, we're here for a while, and you say, that just doesn't seem fair. Well, you can grieve the passing of a loved one, but we have the hope of a reunion, don't we? We have the hope of being joined together, saved of all ages as a throne of God to worship and serve him forever and ever, and that gives meaning to life. And so Paul isn't saying it's wrong to grieve. He's just using the term to say, don't grieve like those who have no hope. Don't grieve like those who think death is the end and there's nothing beyond that. I believe it's important for us to understand this biblical principle about grief because some don't understand the concept when it comes to how to help those going through it acting as if once death has occurred, it should be something that is quickly put aside and not dealt with anymore. But if you've ever dealt with a loved one passing, you know this is not the way grief works. You're not going to get over it in a week or a month or in years. I remember sitting by my wife when she was alive on Mother's Day. Her mother died in 1984. This is in the 2000s, and a song that she used to sing with her mother when she was in church would touch her, and she would break down in tears because she still missed her mother. She was not sinning and doing that. She was remembering the relationship she had and, and how she wished she could still have that kind of relationship. And I have found it amazing as I go along thinking, I, I think I may be getting a handle on this, and then a song comes up, a memory is brought back, and it seems like you just start all over again, having to put things back together again. I know of one individual. This person had a teenage, well, was a, in her mid-20s, died from COVID pneumonia. And she was single, so she, I was trying to help her out on the job she had in Longview as she was in Oklahoma where her daughter lived. And you know what it's, you ever moved before, you know what it's like to pack and try to move and to clean. And so she had to spend several weeks up there trying to get everything put together so they could bring it back to Longview and all of that. And one of the members came in and said, well, how's she doing? I said, well, okay considering everything that has gone on and he goes well it's been a month isn't she over it yet i have to admit at that moment in time my righteous indignation took over i said over it you never get over it 
You learn to live with it but it never leaves you. It's not like she never had that child. It's not like that child never existed. It's not like she didn't feel anguish at the passing of that child. Grief has its own timetable. It can come and go without any seeming provocation. And while we can adjust to the loss, it'll never fully leave us alone. The process becomes part of what defines who we are and where we go from there. So, number one, it is okay to grieve. Jesus did so even though he was Lord and Savior and knew what he had come to accomplish and knew what he was going to provide for us, yet experiencing the human condition he understood. And Paul who seems to be a tower of strength and how he went about preaching the gospel, he knew what it was like for people to grieve. So it's okay to grieve. It's just not a place you want to put the parking brake on. You're there for a while and then you try to move on. Secondly, grief should draw us closer to God. Satan intends to use it to destroy us spiritually, to make us question God's motives. But in reality, if we stop and we look at what Scripture tells us about grief, then it should draw us closer to God and more devoted to God. I personally never prayed to God when Karen died, and you know, my expectations were she was going to come out of the hospital and go through rehab and that things would get back close to normal and that didn't happen. So my expectations did not meet reality. I personally never prayed to God why. I know why. What I prayed, I think, was what the disciples felt every time Jesus told them he had to go to Jerusalem to die. You're the Messiah. You're not supposed to die. It was a quandary for them. And it really broke their heart that Jesus would speak that way. What I prayed was, God, I don't understand. I don't understand. But the process of grief forced me to evaluate how much I trust God, how much I believe his promises through the challenges of life, as well as everything else that's going when I want it to go this way, it's easy to trust God. What happens when your world falls apart and your expectations from what you think Scripture says doesn't match the reality? You're forced to consider passages such as James Five and verse 16, the effective fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. I called every congregation I'd ever been at during the time she was in the hospital. And those congregations called other congregations, and I got figuring it up. And I stopped when I knew there were over a thousand or more people praying for her. But she still died. And I came to the realization this did not fit God's plan for her to continue to live. God has something else in mind. I may not understand it at this point in time, but God's will is sovereign, isn't it? And so, while so many prayed, God knew better as to what he had in store. I thought about Romans 8:28. God works all things for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But where is the good in this? Well, I knew God's greater will was at work. But it would take time to let the emotions subside and to begin thinking logically about everything that had just happened, to consider the possibilities of what that was. Karen's lungs were destroyed by COVID. 
even if she had survived, her quality of life would have been horribly limited at best. And she would have required constant care, which I had already started making plans to do, thinking she would survive. But that would mean I would be leaving the pulpit to do that. And I began thinking about what happened to her and what God providentially was saying to me. As a child of God, I realized God had greater promises for what she would experience in paradise than what I could offer here and now. People come to me and say, do you miss her? I said, every day. Would you bring her back? I said, no. If she's a faithful child of God, she is in paradise. Why would I want her back here to experience sin and all that comes with it again? Yes, I miss her. Would I bring her back? No, I do not want her to come back. I want to go and be with her. I want to go and be with the saved of all ages. I don't want her to come back because that would just be selfishness on my part when she has it so much better now. And I began to realize what would happen if I, she had survived and I had retired and I had devoted the rest of my time to taking care of her. And I realized God, did, God blessed her when he took her. Hard to see at first, but he blessed her. And then I realized, you know what? He's blessing me too. He's still giving me opportunities to preach the gospel. I remember my mother telling a story when I was four years old. Remember when you, back in the 60s, they could do this in schools. You could get a Gideon's Bible, a little New Testament, you know. My mother said I carried that thing around acting like I was preaching from the time I was four years old. So at some point, that got instilled in me very, very early. And it's all I ever wanted to do. God had blessed me that I could continue to serve him and to continue to preach the gospel. Now, that's not always an easy thing to do. And it's not as easy as it once was having her with my side. But then I got thinking about passages like Romans 8 and verse 18. I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. She is with the Lord. And whatever I have to go through, God is still not done with me yet. He's continuing to mold and shape me in his image. He's teaching me life lessons that make me more compassionate and do better in preaching God's word and how to face the challenges of life. Grief is a natural part of the severance of earthly relationships, but we need to consider the blessings that God provides before we pass. First few days, I couldn't get past the fact she's not here anymore. That just doesn't seem fair. Somebody asked me later when they thought they could approach me, says, did you think you both would die at the same time? And I said, no, I thought the Lord would come back and take us before now, but it hasn't worked out that way. It's a natural part until he comes back of earthly ties being broken. But what do we gain from those ties while we have them? And I began thinking about all the good things God had done for me. I realized I should count my blessings for the time we had together, not the fact that she died before I was ready for her to, that he had brought us together and we had married and had this union of the blessing of two children and four grandchildren that are still part of my life, and that I still get to interact and have an influence in them, and how having her as my wife help mold and shape me into being the kind of individual I am as a preacher of the gospel. The reality of death is harsh, but I have memories people 
may not have themselves, of the times we spent together, of all that we went through together. They'll be part of who I am that will help carry me through the rest of my life. And with that comes the fact that, you know what? God does know what he's doing. God is in control. So there's a greater trust in God that he's working his good purposes out for our blessings, and I need to be grateful for the blessings he has given me, as well as being able to trust in him to face the difficulties of where life is leading me now. We'll never understand all of what God knows and has planned for our lives. But we do know his plans are for our good. And then I got thinking about Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor who is first given to him that it might be paid back to him again for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever amen I have to say my relationship with God I thought was fairly deep but it's infinitely deeper now than it was before because it's forced me to realize I have to trust in God and he knows what's best I may not see it from his perspective but I trust him that he has my good in mind and is going to accomplish his purpose in me grief should draw us closer to God lastly grief should lead us to eternal life perhaps prompted by the pagan lifestyle those Christians in Thessalonica were concerned their loved ones who died before Christ's return. Did that mean we're never going to see them again? Does that mean it's all over with with them? What Paul taught about the return of Christ and the resurrection was to offer them hope and encouragement of what lay ahead. Yes, they missed the loved ones that had passed. They wanted to make sure that those loved ones would be part of the resurrection. But Paul wants them to understand that that should be a motivator for how they live as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, We say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Brethren, I don't want to come back to a renovated earth, I'm telling you. Amen. Number one, it's not taught in Scripture. Amen. Number two, I've had enough of the suffering that has come from living in this existence. I want one where sin isn't a part of it anymore. And that's where we're going to be. And we can comfort one another with these words. Death isn't the end. It's not a forever goodbye. It's a see you again in a much better place where the sorrows of life caused by sin will be no more and we'll be in a place where there's no sin. That means no sorrow, no tears, no pain, no suffering. Revelation 21 and verse 4. What we lost when we sinned in the Garden of Eden, we regain in heaven forever. We should live in a way where the promise that motivated faithful loved ones to commit themselves to Christ and to so live that when they pass, they would be with him, that should motivate us to have that kind of life too and to seek the Lord. So until our Lord returns, we will know grief. Grief due to sin that touches us in so many ways. But the grief Satan may want to use to destroy us can be a positive force in our being there for each other.
to rely more on God's promises. In looking to what lies ahead, where the grief of separation will be no more. Until then, grief is part of the healing process God uses to help us through death. To trust in him, to know that he loves us, and that we're headed to a place where the source of grief no longer exists. Do I miss her? Every day. But you know what? It's a great incentive to want to be joined together again. And that's how we need to let our minds help influence our emotions. That this is tough, there's an adjustment, but I can get through it because God is going with me. He's got a perfect will, he's fulfilling. And in the end, we all get to be together with him. And it doesn't get better than that. Thank you.